You are listening to Meet the Thriller Author, the podcast where I interview writers of mysteries, thrillers, and suspense books. I'm your host, Alan Peterson, and this is episode number 49. For this episode, I'll be meeting with Tara Ellis. She is a best-selling author of a popular middle-grade mystery series, The Samantha Wolf Mysteries, which has uh, hit the bestseller status on Amazon in the children's detective story genre several times and continues to grow in popularity. Her stories uh, herald back to the days of Nancy Drew and Trixie Belden. So it was a lot of fun to talk to Tara about writing uh, mystery novels uh, aimed at kids and middle grade. So we'll uh, learn a lot about that and about her process and a whole bunch more here in just a second. Uh, before I take it to the interview, just a reminder to uh, rate and our rate the podcast on iTunes is the best way to help me to get the word out and also to check uh, audibletrial.com forward slash MTTA great way to get the uh, audiobooks uh, including uh, Tara Ellis's books are available uh, so check that out it's a great way to sponsor the podcast so here is my interview with Tara Ellis Hi everybody, this is Alan with uh, Meet the uh, Thriller Author, and today I'm going to be talking with uh, Tara Ellis, who I have on Skype. Tara, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing very good. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for being on the podcast. I appreciate it. Well, yeah. Thanks for having me. So I know you you, you write in a couple different genres, and we'll get into that in a, in a sec, but uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your and your background? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Well, let's see. I'm 45, and I live in the Pacific Northwest in the rain shadow. Uh, beautiful area, though, because of that rain. Um, perfect spot for me because I love to get out and hike. It's where I get my best moments of inspiration. Or if I have a writer's block, I just go and climb a mountain, and it somehow all comes to me. And I've got two uh, grown kids now, and... I used to be a uh, firefighter, EMT volunteer, but um, I stopped doing that about five, six years ago. And now I, I work as a registration clerk in the local emergency room and focus on, on writing most of the rest of the time. Yeah. And uh, how many books do you have out right now? Oh, let's see. Um, published, I have got 13. That's not including the box sets. I think I have, I have 16 publications in all, and 11 full-length novels, two short stories, a photography book, and then two box sets. Wow, so you've been keeping up busy with all <laughs> with your uh, personal stuff and all this writing. That's very impressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, I think I have adult ADD, so um, I have to be doing at least three things at once, and most of the time I, I am. <laughs> Oh, well, that's good. You're channeling it in the right energies. <laughs> for, yeah. For your yes. Yes. I try to keep good vices. Uh, so you're writing in. So you're writing in two different genres, and um, the first one under, under your Tara Ellis name was is fascinating because I wasn't f- very familiar with it. The middle grade yeah. mystery detectives. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's where I found my love for books as a child growing up. Um, I always loved to read and write from about six, seven years old. But when I discovered Nancy Drew and Trixie Belden, it's where I really um, discovered reading as a, a form of healthy escapism, as a way to kind of transport myself to a, a different place and even as a different person. And and those were just good, wholesome, fun stories that had usually a positive message and, and good endings, especially the Trixie Bowden series, which um, obviously isn't as well known as the Nancy Drew Hardy Boys. But my aunt had the original hard copies of most of those books. And I Montana and visited our family. The, the one thing I looked forward to the most were the nights that I would spend staying up, you know, over half the night reading these books, just devouring them. And ever since then, you know, it, that's when I really developed this desire to to give that same experience to um, to other people and especially other young readers as a way to discover this new world of um, of uh, happiness. You know, just a, a good safe place to go when things aren't maybe going so great. 
And so it's always been that desire originally to have something similar to that genre, and um, especially as a series. And the first book in the series, The Mystery of Hollow Inn, I actually began writing that when I was 15 years old. Oh, uh-huh. <laughs> it's a true story. I actually started it when I was in, um, not suspension, it was like in-house suspension at high school for being late. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so again, that positive channeling, I decided to, um, probably should have been doing homework, but uh, instead I was writing. And um, and that's how that story came about. It was based on on myself and my best friend growing up. I even had our names in it at first, but... Um, I finished it when I was about 20, and back then, the way you uh, got a book published was you submitted it to, uh, you know, a hundred different agents who would, you would hope would represent you, because the only way to get published back then was traditionally, and so I printed the manuscripts out on my old dot matrix with my Commodore 64. For those youngsters that might be listening, you have no idea what I'm talking about, that's okay, Um, but it was a long process, and I sent those out, and... um, the only response I got at that time was from a vanity press, which, like so many other authors, even still to this day, um, I was almost suckered into it. And I got super excited, believing I was going to be published. And when I the realization dawned on me after getting the contract that, oh, no, they wanted me to pay to do it. Um, I was devastated. And I, I put the manuscript script literally in a box, in a shoe box, and put it on a shelf. And it wasn't until about four years ago after I finished the first book in my young adult sci-fi trilogy and was taking a quote-unquote break, um, I decided to pull that old manuscript back out and rewrite it. And that is how um, the Samantha Wolf Mysteries was born. Um, I rewrote that one while I was taking my break. I, I completely changed the, the um, point of view that it was written from. I added several chapters. I changed the names. But the essence of that story is still the same one I wrote back when I was 15 years old. And I just, I love it for that reason. Um, and I actually, this past weekend, it won um, first place in the uh, the Gertrude Warner Mystery Chanticleer uh, Awards. It's an international book contest. Um, oh, and awesome. Congrats on that. Thank you. You know, it's just kind of magical the way it's, it's all come around. Now I actually have young readers that are... Um, sharing with me how they've read it you know six eight times and and they love it and they love samantha wolf and how incredible is it to know that you know young readers that the same point in their life that i was when i started reading trixie Button and nancy drew are now you know looking at at my books and thinking of them the same way i did back then about those books and it's just it's amazing it, it feels great yeah, yeah, that is great. And are they still publishing Nancy Drews or in the Hardy Boys? They're oh, they're out there. Um, I did a talk at a at our local um, elementary school a few weeks back, and so I actually looked it up. And Nancy Drew, they began writing that in the 1930s, if you can believe it. Wow, 1930s is when Nancy Drew started. Um, and Trixie Belden was not far behind, I think, in the late 40s. And those are still, you can look them up on Amazon. They've still got them up there. They're coming out now in ebooks. There's, of course, all the other serial, you know, branch offs from that with um, different versions. And um, I, I liked Trixie Belden a lot more than I did Nancy Drew as far as the character goes. And Trixie Belden was younger and much more endearing. And just, uh, I could definitely relate to her more than I could Nancy Drew. And that's how my characters, they're 12 years old, the two main characters, um, 12 year old girls that are just very, um, I, I like to think of them as believable and relatable and, and present day uh, that the readers of today can, can very much relate to the issues that they encounter. And I always have at least two or three different storylines kind of threading throughout the story in addition to the main mystery that all kind of ties together in the end so that by the end hopefully the reader feels like they've gone on this journey with the characters of of a little bit of self-discovery too um and and at the end they're they're left feeling good and it's you know with a positive message so yeah i think that's so cool and you know I've interviewed over 40 authors now for this podcast, and I I should go back and check because the percent I bet it's more than 50 percent because I always ask how they got started. Nancy yeah. Drew and the Hardy Boys comes up all the time, so it's really cool. Yeah. You might be influencing f- future uh, writers, you know, 
20, 30 years from now. <laughs> yeah, oh, wouldn't that be incredible? Uh, this is just awesome. And that's, yeah. And, and even myself, you know, I got I have a, I have an older brother and a sister, and I got started with my sister, Nancy Drew, and my brother, the yep. Hardy Boys. It's just, yeah. It's just fascinating. And you know why? It's because they're they're quick reads. Um, they have they have short chapters. They have simple stories, but they're fun and they're engaging and they're um, somewhat believable. I think um, that's you know sometimes it gets a little kind of what people say Scooby Doo ish or Disney <laughs> Disney ish, but that's part of the fun. You know, it, it's a light hearted read, and kids especially need that in their lives. They need that light hearted, positive message. Um, amongst everything else that's going on. And I think that a lot of adults yearn for that too. And that's why I have a lot of adult readers. They all say, oh, I love it. And, may, you know, I remember the um, Boxcar Children and Nancy Drew and Trixie Belden. And I even had someone comment that after reading it, it's now sitting on the shelf next to, to those books. And that kind of made me cry. <laughs> yeah, that is that'd be, that's you know? incredible. Yeah. yeah, but I think, you know, at, at the heart of it, um, a, a lot of people, the kind of escape that they want is just that lighthearted, good feeling, you know, and and I, that's what I aim for with that series. And so, those are sort of like the mystery is like a whodunit towards the, towards the end. Is that part of the 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 story? Yes. Yeah, there's always the whodunit element. There's of course the danger element, but it's a light danger. These are all G pushing PG maybe in some people's minds just because there is a, a danger there. Um, but no one ever actually gets hurt per se. Um, but there's always the, the whodunit. It, I, but I always also tie in um, either something like a, a ghost story or a legend or a myth or a local, you know, mystery from the past type of thing and so with a lot of my stories you the reader is kind of left wondering oh was there really a ghost or wasn't there mm-hmm. was that really bigfoot or was it something else was the ghost really there or was it just was it really this and so there's kind of that that fun element to it um for example one of my books the the sixth one in the series is called a mysterious christmas on orcas island um and orcas island is in, in the san juan islands uh just offshore from where i live and also from where the fictional town of oceanside where the kids live and so i try to tie in local things too with my stories um so orcas island is real and the moran mansion in the story is real and has a lot of history um, and I actually went to Orcas and spent a couple of days interviewing people and finding a true local ghost story to tie into the Orcas Island story. And it ended up being a lot of fun. Had a lot of fun with that one. Yeah, that's, that does sound like a lot of fun. Uh, cool, yeah. re- cool research. <laughs> yeah, my current one, book number eight, takes place up in Alaska. And, oh, I so want to jump on a plane and go up to catch a can. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't think that one's in the cards, at least not right now. But I would, I would so do it if I could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, not maybe not in the winter though. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, yeah, a few more months would be a little better. <laughs> <laughs> and so now your 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 other uh, uh, books. Uh, so you're using the Tara Myers uh, name, and I guess that's so the kids, so they don't the two worlds don't collide. That's yes, absolutely. The yeah under Ellis, um, my my present legal name. I have the the children's mystery series, and I also have a young adult sci-fi trilogy. Um, but those are both clean reads. The sci-fi trilogy is more of a PG-13, but it's still clean. Um, my goal when writing those was that my kids could read them and not be embarrassed by it. I think I accomplished that. <laughs> um, and so I've got those, and I also have a, a short story. It's a, it's a true story based on a, a local girl last year that was in a plane crash in the Cascade Mountains, and she walked away from that. Her grandparents, unfortunately, died in the crash. But that was a, a, a true short story. Um, and so when I, I came to writing this new series under the uh, romantic suspense, it was just such a challenge. When you go into marketing, you know, as an indie author, it's, marketing is huge, and it took me a couple of years to figure that out, and I'm still learning it. But there's so many platforms that you really have to work at building, including a mailing list, uh, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Goodreads, everything. And the focus, of course, of building that social media is your reader. And with my, um, it's been really hard even having both the 
the middle grade and the young adult under the same name. I've had to split my mailing lists in two because obviously a, a nine-year-old reading my mystery series isn't necessarily going to want to read this 90,000-word young adult dystopian, and it really wouldn't be appropriate to market that to them. So I've even had to split that um, persona in half as far as marketing goes, and that was hard enough. And so the thought of having to split it three ways was just too much for me. So I just set up a profile under my maiden name of Myers, and I have everything linked. It's not like I'm, you know, trying to hide behind another name. It's not that. It's just that for marketing purposes, I needed to put a different tag on it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that would be hard because, uh, yeah, you're basically building three mailing, different mailing lists and three, yes. yeah, three brands that you're managing. Right, uh-huh. right. It's a clean read, though, um, yeah. my new series. it's. I mean, there there's definitely adult elements in it, but it's still considered a PG-13. Mm-hmm. And so can you tell us a little bit about your Chris Echo Files uh, then? And yeah. The Tara yes. Myers, right? <laughs> Yes, Tara Myers. Who am I talking to? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's me. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, um, the Chris Echo Files. So when I said that I'm... I'm writing my my children's series just for the love of the story and not for money because it's a small genre. It's it's really hard. Um, And let's be honest, you know, as a self-employed author, yeah, I'm doing it because I love it. But my goal ultimately is to be a full time author. In order to do that, I have to make money. So absolutely, that's a factor. Um, And looking at my uh, long term goals that way, I wasn't going to accomplish that in the children's genre. And looking at the genres that are successful, um, adult thrillers, uh, romance, romantic suspense, I mean, that's where it's at, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I I love to read that kind of a book. And so in deciding which way I wanted to go, uh, I couldn't go so far as to write in the some of the top main genres because that's not where my heart is um i need to really be into what i'm writing about in order for it to work and for me to do that i still need to keep it clean you know i I just don't have it in me to to go beyond pg-13 with my writing and um so i had this story that i had started to write about 10 years ago and it was called shades of fear and i'd gotten about three quarters of the way through the story And I had made the same mistake with this one as I did with probably at least 10 other books I started to write but failed to finish was I hadn't started with a good outline. And that was the turning point for me about four years ago when I got into researching how to write, you know, how to really write a book. Because while I've always loved to write, I had never really figured that part out. I, you know, thought I had written an outline. But when I got into really researching what an outline was, I realized I wasn't doing it right, at least not for me. It's really a personal preference for each writer. But for me, I need a good, solid outline from beginning to end. I have an eight-point system I use for writing my plot. And then I go back, and then I do a chapter by chapter. And that changes and evolves as I'm actually writing writing the book, but um, but I start with an intensive outline. And so when I had began writing this story, what, eight, ten years ago, I got lost in it, mm-hmm. like I do if I don't have an outline. But it, I liked it. You know, I, I thought it was good. It was a thriller. Um, it was intense. It, it had some really good elements to it. And so I, it had been nagging at me, you know, come on, finish me, finish me. But I had just been into, you know, c- completing my trilogy and then writing my kid's book. And so when it came down to figuring out, you know, what genre would I be okay writing in that's also going to get me towards my goal of being um, a full-time author. And I realized that the book that I had started and been wanting to finish, maybe that could be it. And so I, I totally rewrote it. Um, I, I did an outline and I changed it up just a bit and I completely rewrote it. And that, and I changed the title because uh, during the time that I originally came up with that title and now Shades of Grey came out and, and it was just too close to, <laughs> I just couldn't do it. I had to change the title. Uh, and so applying what I have learned over the past few years in marketing, I came up with a plan shocker before I did it and my marketing plan began with the um, using my maiden name creating all the platforms before I even wrote the book and building that audience and then I had to get my magnet I had to get something to to pull readers in to an author they've never heard of before and to try to entice them to read a full-length novel that they might pay for and so I wrote a short story um, called a distant echo 
And that was the other part of my marketing plan was with the title, I wanted to incorporate uh, the series as a whole and to make it all very cohesive. And so I got a little um, creative again. And this happened on one of my hikes when I was brainstorming. A lot of my notebooks are dirty. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was sitting along um, Mount Baker Lake when I, I wrote this idea down. Um, I changed the name of the main character to Chris Echo. And I decided to tie that name into the series itself as well as the titles of the book. And I studied books in that genre. And I, I looked at their covers and I looked at their titles and I looked at their series names, trying to figure out what works in that genre. And so I came up with uh, Chris Echo and the Chris Echo Files. And I'm going to incorporate that name into all of the cover, into all of the, uh, the books. And so the first one is a little bit different because it's a short story and it's free. And it's uh, basically just a lead-in to, to what happens right before that first book and what kind of um, prompts her to go on this vacation. And so it's called A Distant Echo. And it, it's a pretty much all an intense scene between her and uh, um, a serial killer. And there's a shooting. And so this, this hall sets up her being pretty much forced to go on this vacation that happens in Echo of Fear. And um, if do you get that Echo of oh, Fear? Oh, yeah, I like it. Hey, no, I like cool, it. Huh? Yeah, I, yeah. I saw those titles. I was like, oh, I, I see what you're doing. I like yeah. it. <laughs> and, and so then the other titles are going to be Echo of, like Echo of Murder, Echo of Love, Echo of Deceit, um, that kind of thing. And also the covers. Um after looking at a lot of, of the covers within that genre and some of the other crime and thriller and suspense ones, there's a lot of silhouettes. Mm. There's a lot of shadows. There's um, a lot of, you know, it kind of gives that intrigue and mystery, but I wanted it to also have motion in it. And I wanted there to be a gun so that you immediately know that it's like a crime thriller. And so I had this envision of Chris Echo's silhouette as she's turning around with the gun in her hand and her hair's kind of flying out. I'm trying to find a stock image of that. It, and sort of the same thing happened with this that happened with me with my kids' covers. I'm also a photographer. And so when I can't find a picture that I want, of course, my natural instinct is, well, I'll just take it myself. <laughs> and so all of my kids' covers, um, the girls that are on those covers, I, I took those pictures of them. And along with horrible handwritten mock-up drawings of what I wanted the rest of it to look like, um, Mel at uh, Michelle Designs takes my photos and then comes up with the rest with her Photoshop magic. And so we did the same with the Echo covers. Um, <laughs> the silhouette. So I don't know if I... <laughs> Well, I don't know if I should admit this, but that silhouette is actually me. Oh, my God. Um, that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> that, if, if someone could see that photo shoot, it was pretty <laughs> hilarious. That involved me in my family room standing on a box with a fan under me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll charge the angels. I can see yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, it is. And that's a, a real it's a real gun. Um, and so I was very safe, of course. It was mm -hmm. empty. And I even got into some discussions already with people about, well, where's your other finger? My other finger is along the, um, the side of the weapon, as it should be, at the ready. You do not keep your finger on the trigger unless you're going to shoot it. So um, I'm holding the, the weapon accurately just for those of you that are up on that. Um, but, yeah, that's me. I, I, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to do my own picture because... I'm gonna, you know, I can't find the silhouette that I want. So there is a l little bit of Photoshop magic in that. I had a few requests for my for my um, cover designer to do a few things to make it look more like Chris Echo versus me. My dogs are barking. Um, so yeah, that's so I I came up with that, and then so that silhouette will be on all the covers with a different background. You really don't have to worry about someone using the same stock image over and over and over, like my the guy I, the guy in my book covers. <laughs> <laughs> He's everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you know, and it, you probably know too that to pay for the complete oh, rights yeah. to an image, it's really expensive. So yeah, I don't have to do that. Yeah, that's 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 fantastic. I mean, and yeah, like you said, the, to to actually pay for exclusivity is just it's cost prohibitive for most indies, for most it anybody, is. I think. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then the the covers on my sci-fi trilogy, the the beautiful 
young lady on those covers is my daughter. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's another thing. Even if you're going to hire your own photo shoot, I mean, you would have to hire models and, and photographers. Yep. I mean, that's also very expensive. It is. So, yeah, and the yeah. young ladies, yeah, the young ladies on my, my children's series, uh, I'm friends, their mom and I are, are good friends and I've known them for quite some time and I pay each of them a, a small sum, but I, I, you know, I, I do pay them individually for each photo shoot that we do and then they get credit within the book and they also get free copies. So they're more than happy with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's, 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 that's awesome. That's the, yeah. that's the first one that, I, that, that, that I've had and they look great. The cover looks great. It's like you said, it really, you. it really jumps out. You know, there's no, you know what it's about. It's a thriller. Um, right. So yeah, so that's, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, that was my that was my goal with that cover was, you know, when you see that, you know immediately mm-hmm. what genre it is. So there's no guessing there. And, and hopefully that will then attract that audience to look further at it and, you know, to, tr- to read the, um, the blurb. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And uh, so, so when you start, you say you you, you outline these. Um, how long does the outline process takes you uh, before you actually start writing? Well, it's it's different for each book, of course, depending on the length. My my kids' books take a couple of weeks, probably, um, of just thinking about it, jotting stuff down. I <laughs> have notes all over the place. Um, they're also wet because the other place I I like to brainstorm is in the hot tub. So most of my notebooks are either have water damage or they have dirt on them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so my kids' books typically take a couple of weeks on an outline and then about a month to write and then a couple of weeks to edit. So I can turn out my kids' books within a couple of months each. Um, my trilogy took me a long time. The third book in the trilogy is the longest. It's ninety four thousand. Mm. I spent months on that outline. I spent as much time on the outline as I did writing it because it was extremely involved. There was a lot of backstory, a lot of research. It involved um, some real history and legends and also um, conspiracy theories. But there was also DNA splicing and retroviruses and a bunch of stuff. And with all of my stories, I always try to have at least enough element of truth and reality to make the reader go, is this real or not? And actually, you know, research it and look it up. I have some GPS coordinates in my books that are real. The I looked up the location where the where they would be and got the real GPS coordinates so that if someone actually looked, they'd find it. You know, little things yeah. like that. Yeah, so um, the Echo series, that book, it took me, it took me a few weeks on the outline to... Uh, until I was at the point where I felt comfortable enough to, to go back when I rewrote it. Mm-hmm. Um, it was actually harder since I had already started it. I would rather have just started from scratch again because it was it was a lot more challenging to go back to something that I had already written before and change it. Um, but yeah, it, I would say on, on the length of book that uh, the Echo series are, uh, it was a few weeks for the outline. And what do you, what do you use to outline and, and, and to write? Do you use like Word or, or Scrivener or...? Yeah, I just use Word. Well, at first, it's just by hand. My initial brainstorming is always by hand. I write it down. I have a notebook for each each individual book that I'm working on. And I start with uh, the setting. Yeah, well, obviously, the genre. Um, and then the, the story idea and the setting. And then the characters. And the backstories. And then any additional stories and how they're going to interweave. And then I go with my um, my plot points. And the foreshadowings and then the the subplots to the foreshadowings and then the subplots to that. And so that by the time you get to the end, it's all very cohesive. Uh, I do such a complete outline and edit as I go that I have never, like at, since I started this process, after I finish writing something, you know, of course, there's lots of editing go- going on afterwards, but I've never actually had to go back and rewrite a whole scene or rewrite a whole chapter or add a scene or add a chapter or change anything because it didn't work. Nice. Um, mm-hmm. I have it all so plotted and figured out to such a point that it's all there when I start to write it. So that's how I don't get lost. Otherwise, I it wouldn't work. Yeah, that, that's who I am. Yep. Yeah, that probably helps you come up with a, a, a cleaner uh, a first draft probably than I would imagine. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, that'd, yeah. Be, that'd be nice. I got to start doing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and my, man, my process is once I start to write, my goal is to write one chapter a day. And so I'll start with reading the chapter that I wrote the day before. But when I write something, you know, I'll write it and then I'll go back and reread what I wrote and edit that and then I send it to my mom <laughs> and, then, and then I print it out because I do I edit much better if, if it's on paper mm. and so I'll print it out and then I'll go through and I'll edit that and so by the time I have my first draft done it's technically already been edited two or three times um, and then once I usually once I get to the halfway point of the book I go back and I reread what I've written already I have a short term memory issue seriously I have to if I don't do that I'm likely to forget details, mm. and I don't want to um, have to go back and, and do that with the whole manuscript because then it can get overwhelming. I think a lot of authors get overwhelmed, you know, when if you finish a, this huge manuscript and you know, you know when you go back and read that, there's going to be things that don't make sense and you're going to have to rewrite stuff. That can really be overwhelming, and for me, I, I have to, to prevent that from happening so that I, I move forward. Yeah, that's like, yeah. You, when you first finish, you're like all excited, and then you have to go back. You're like, oh my god, that's like sixty, <laughs> seventy, eighty thousand words, and yes, and then yeah, like you said, things just doesn't make sense, and yeah, yeah, <laughs> like now the real work starts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and then you have to go. Then after all that, then you have to market. It's just never ending, right? <laughs> it oh yeah, it really is. Um, it definitely takes a certain kind of personality to be an indie author. I think it's um, it's different. It is different than being a traditional offer, author um, when it comes to being successful. Very, very rarely is a book just written and put out there and and takes off. I, I know it happens, mm-hmm. but you're talking one in a million. Yeah. Uh, most of the indie authors that have been successful, they're successful because they're multifaceted and they have a lot of different skills and not just writing. Yeah, well, and even for traditional authors or, or, or small, people who go with a small press... Uh, they, yes. they have to do a lot of the this, this stuff themselves now too so very few of the authors get all the the big marketing push <laughs> that exactly uh, well that's the thing unless you're with one of the big five you can you can pretty much count on it on having to do a lot of your own marketing yeah so uh, so now you're so I see your you, you have your your daughters and your and, and your cover and yourself on your cover how about your personalities? Do any of those make it into your books at all? Like, <laughs> like a little hidden or? <laughs> oh, yeah. There's a little bit of me in all of it. I, I have to admit that. You know, we write what we know. Yeah. <laughs> and especially um, my trilogy is, is told first person. And so there's got to be a little bit of personality that comes out when you're writing first person. I actually had um, someone who knows both myself and my daughter, not real well, but they, you know, they know us and they knew my daughter was on the cover and they said, so is this character based on your daughter? And I just kind of laughed and I'm like, you know, if I'm honest with you, I'd have to say there's more of me in there than my daughter. Um, and, you know, we share some traits, of course, but it's not based on me. None of my characters are, are based specifically on anyone except for, you know, as I mentioned in The Mystery of Hollow Inn, back when I wrote those, you know, when I was 15, the, the idea and the concept behind those characters was based on me and my best friend. So I would have to say out of, you know, out of all of them, Samantha Wolf, my main character in my kids series, is most close, I think, to me, um, to my personality, at least how I was maybe when I was younger or how I perceived myself. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a difference. Um, so, yeah, I think that if I think any writer, you know, if they're on it's excuse me if they're honest um at some point anyways a little bit of themselves has to work its way in there because that's it's part of who we are mm-hmm. yep i agree yeah i think so yeah and uh and where do you usually write do you have like a, do you have a place that i could in your house or you go to coffee shops or <laughs> yeah i have a spot um there's been a lot of talk lately among some of my writer friends about, oh, you have to write in a coffee shop, and there's even a blog about it. And I think that's amazing if someone can do that. I can't. I I am a creature of habit. I, I have to sit in the same spot with everything in the same place, and I have my candle, and I have my <laughs> lights on just the right way, and the, my pillows. And, yeah, I have a, um, a spot in my front room. Where, where I sit and I've got everything laid out before me and I have to have that consistency 
And a lot of it, I think, has to do with being able to relax and know that this time and this place is set aside specifically for my writing so I don't worry about anything else. And I cannot write if I'm not in that zone. I've tried. I've tried writing in a coffee shop. I've tried writing in the vehicle while going on a trip. I've tried writing in a tent while I was camping. I've tried writing on downtime at work. And aside from doing edits and out, some outlining, I there's no way. Yeah, you can't get in the zone. <laughs> I can't get in the zone. And I know that if I if I push myself too hard and try to write when I'm not in my zone, it's not going to be good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and how about the is do you do you need silence or music? I need silence. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I need silence. I first um, when I first started writing, I would put headphones on and I had background like Zen music, not anything with words, but just Zen music. And I can't even do that now. I just need to have it. I need silence. <laughs> Otherwise, I get distracted. I'm I'm like, ooh, something shiny. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm easily distracted, and so I, I definitely need to be in my zone. Now, another thing that that, that I found so fascinating when we were talking to, uh, before uh, before I hit the record button is uh, your audiobooks, which, uh, which you have you have uh, your books uh, on audio uh, yeah. with Audible, and you did your own narration. That's uh, I think that's yeah. so awesome because because <laughs> I my first book I had I had I I had went through that route and. Whoa, that was expensive. So mm. I haven't done that for the second one. So can you tell yeah. us a little bit about that process and how that, how that yeah. came about? So um, it kind of goes back to my need to constantly be doing something. <laughs> and uh, and I, I tend to um, torture myself a little bit and take on things. And so, you know, when it came to the whole audiobook thing and a couple years ago, it seemed to really be gaining in popularity. ACX was getting bigger and I had a couple of author friends that were having audiobooks made. And I'm like, man, I need to have audiobooks done. So I put my first book up that I had completed and written, which was Infected. It's the first book in my young adult trilogy. I put that up for auditions. And I had several people audition and they weren't bad, but they weren't me. <laughs> <laughs> and you know my inner voice when I'm when I'm writing when I'm reading it's it's mine especially since it's first person mm -hmm. and so I'm listening to the um, to the auditions and the one gal that I liked the most she sounded like me <laughs> <laughs> and so I sent off the um, the audio clip to uh, another author friend of mine and just for the heck of it I I just recorded myself on my phone you know just a really short clip of the same scene and I said you know what listen to this let me know what you think and he wrote me back he goes you know what you sound just as good or better do it yourself mm -hmm. I'm like I have no idea how to do that but okay <laughs> and so I started researching and um, you know figure out what microphone to buy and I downloaded um, audible which is a free um, mastering program I didn't even know what mastering was when I started <laughs> this um, and and so the process began I, I set up my own little cave I call it which is basically a, a small box made out of foam encasing me inside and um, wherever I can find a spot to put it and so the recording although it's really challenging as I would probably say is the easy part it's, it's the mastering process afterwards especially for a perfectionist like myself that will go through every single space and remove every single little clip or pop or <laughs> whir. and I would spend probably a couple of hours on like a 10 to 15 minute clip editing it um but fortunately, I guess the outcome is okay because I've had all good feedback on, on how the books sound. Mm -hmm. um, infected, I counted, had 27 voices in it. Wow. Uh, they, uh, and so doing a man's voice, um, I will be completely honest with you. I had never listened to an audiobook before I recorded my own. Um, I don't like to be read to. I like reading to people. I always have. I've been in theater Big shocker. Yeah, uh, I was going to say you, if you had an acting background for all that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I've done I've done some theater, not outside of high school, well, a little bit outside of high school, but not too much. But you know, I've I've been in theater since elementary school. I was in a creative arts troupe and did a bunch of fun stuff. So I'm not shy, um, but I'd never done voice characters, which acting and narrating for an audiobook are very different creatures. Mm -hmm. um, There's some of the same 
talents, I think, that go into it, but it's definitely different. Uh, you have to, you know, be sure to articulate and you have to do the right tempo and spacing. And for me, one of the big things that turned me off from listening to audiobooks was that I would get irritated with the voices. You know, if, if it was too much, I would just, I couldn't, it would pull me from the story because it would be distracting. And I know everybody has a different point of view on this, but for me, my goal with narrating was to, to make enough of a difference in the voice, mostly from tone and from inflection um, versus how I actually, you know, sound and to be able to tell that it was a different person. And so, of course, for the male voices, you know, I try to drop my voice and sound more like a man, <laughs> but um, but I didn't go overboard. Maybe a little bit with the professor. He was a, um, a, a Egyptian professor with an accent and so I had a little bit of fun with him he was a little hokey but uh, I couldn't <laughs> help it um, but bottom line um, I just tried to to do a lot of different inflection and pacing and personality you know that each of the character has a different personality versus kind of being over the top dramatic um, and that's what works for me and it seems to be working okay for listeners mm-hmm. um, I've gotten mostly mostly good feedback I've got how many do I have out I have the first two in my children's series and the first one in my young adult trilogy. And then I also narrated the short story, Getting Out Alive, which is the the true story based on a local teen that survived an airplane crash. Um, I've got those four. And I'm currently right now actually narrating a short story for another author. I'm branching out into narrating for other people. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm working on that. And then I might I might just tackle Echo of Fear. I think that would be a blast to narrate. I would love I would love to do that one. So I think that'll be my next venture. Wow, yeah. And then are you still what are you currently writing on uh, working on now uh, writing wise? So right right this moment I am working on the Shadow or the Legend of Shadow Mountain, which is book number 8 in the Samantha Wolf Mysteries. And I, this is going to be my favorite, I think, um, of the series. The the kids, uh, f- there's five of them, um, five friends in their group, and they they go up to Alaska for a trip, and something happens, and they find themselves in the wilds of Alaska and have to hike out. Um, and of course, all sorts of things happen to them while they're doing this, including solving a local legend that ties into a local fishing village and. And Samantha Wolf's father, who is a um, commercial fisherman, whom they're going up to visit. So, again, there's a, a few different elements in it, um, but this one's going to be a lot of action and adventure, and with a just hopefully enough of a twist of a mystery and uh, a little treasure hunting in there. So, um, so it's a lot of fun. And then after that, I plan on working on the second book in the Chris Echo Files. And do you like uh, you work one at a time? You don't. You, yeah. Yeah, I would imagine. I I had a brief moment of thinking I could do two at once. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't last very long. Uh, nope. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if I'm writing in different point of views. No. Uh, my kids series is uh, third person present, and Chris Echo is third person past. My trilogy is first person present. Um, so. That, that takes a little wrap in your brain around, too, to go back and forth. But the Chris Echo one, I, I think what, what it comes down to is what the reader prefers. And I have found, I thought I was being adventurous with my kids' series doing third-person present, which is not typical. Um, and it was a huge challenge, which I enjoy. I like to stretch myself as an author and try different things. And, and um, it's how I see it in my head. I when I'm writing I see it in my head before I write it or as I'm writing it so it's like I'm writing it as it happens because that's how I'm seeing it and so that's just what comes naturally for me Um, but I discovered that a lot of adult readers they prefer the more standard third person past because Mm -hmm. that's what they're used to yeah but the kids love it the kids love the present tense Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm sticking to that with my kids series but with the adult series I'm going again with what's going to work best and that's what the adults tend to, to like the best is the third person past tense. So that's what that series is in. Yeah, and I noticed that the distant echo you have it set for free on Amazon and your website, I would imagine. So people want to go check yes. that out. Yeah. Yes, distant echo is absolutely free. Um, it's available wide, so you can get that in any format that you want from pretty much any platform. Um, and 
echo of fear is it is um, only on Amazon, and that's because I have found some success with the Kindle Unlimited program, and I love to have the option of having all of my books available for free to anybody who's in Kindle Unlimited. Um, mm-hmm. I just I really like to do that. It's it's worked for me, and it just kind of simplifies things too. I just have one platform to manage and to look at. And I just have too much going on. <laughs> yeah, it looks like you're busy, busy, busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, Echo of Fear. You know, it's a suspense thriller, and I labeled it romantic suspense because that's the closest formula that it follows. And my editor agreed with me after reading it. Um, you know, I asked her before I hadn't really come up with a. A specific subgenre, and I said, you know, what do you think it is? She immediately said, romantic suspense. Mm-hmm. I'm like, are you sure? I mean, it's kind of light on the romance. There's nothing real steamy. She's like, no, definitely follows that formula. So I went with it. Oh, okay, well, that's, that's good. Works good. Works good. And so then, when's the next one coming out in that series? I guess you know, write it. <laughs> yeah, I still have to write that one. I've already got the general outline in my head. And the first few scenes in my head, um, but nothing on paper yet. So my kids' book, I'm I'm writing. I hope to have that out in May. I think the the next one is going to be Echo of Murder, and it I'll start that in probably late May or early June. And I'm not real sure how long that one's going to take me. I've got some things going on this summer. I'll probably be selling my house and, and making a move. So it just kind of depends on what goes on with that. But I definitely plan on having that one out um, before the end of this summer and maybe even a third one before the end of the year. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm impressed with your uh, output. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, it's just all about... Um, you know, tempo and keeping mm-hmm. the momentum going. If I pause too long, I think like with anything in life, it's easy to get bogged down. And so, so long as I just keep moving forward with, you know, this or that and, and keep busy. I mean, I love to do it. I enjoy it. It's, it's my downtime. I mean, oh, a lot of my time now, but it's how I kind of center myself and relax. And I write because I have to, I mean, it's, it's just part of who I am and I just feel so blessed that, you know, I'm able to uh, to do this with, with something that I love so much and potentially be successful at it. It's it's pretty cool. Where can readers find you? You're on, uh, you have a website and you have Facebook and Twitter and all that good stuff? I do have all of that stuff. Um, the easiest way to find me is just go into Amazon, type in Tara Ellis or type in Tara Myers and... There I am. You know, it's all there. Um, under Ellis, of course, you'll find the, the kids and the young adult in the short story. And then under Myers, M-E-Y-E-R-S, is where you'll find um, Echo of Fear. And then the, the free one, A Distant Echo, you know, you can you can just do a search for A Distant Echo, and it, it should come up on several places. Um, but, yeah, Amazon, I think, is, is the most refined place to find me. I'm also on Facebook, and I am on Twitter, and I have a blog. Uh, just under Tara Ellis. Um, I, I do a little journalistic writing on the side with a local uh, news uh, media called Skagit Breaking. It's gotten pretty big in our area. So I'm, I'm spread out in a few different places, but I'm <laughs> most, uh, most refined place to find me would probably be Amazon because that's the easiest way to pick those items up. All right, great, Tara. Well, before I let you go, anything else you'd like to say to, uh, to our listeners? You know, I guess what I'd like to say is I, I really strive to write a story that will give you entertainment and escape, but is also a clean read with, with all of the other elements that readers um, tend to look for. And that's important to me, not only because I have kids. You know, sometimes it's challenging to find a book within those, those really popular genres that have a clean read label on it. Um, that can actually say this is a rated PG-13 book. And that's important to me. So I guess I just kind of like to reach out to those readers that enjoy a good, intense story with maybe a little bit of romance and that edge-of-your-seat kind of a story that that really pulls you in, but you don't have to worry about cringing while you're reading it. Um, You don't have to skip any pages. It's okay to have your, your teenager read it too, to pass it on to someone else without having to worry if they're going to be, you know, embarrassed or insulted by any of that. And it, it's 
nothing against the writers that that are that are okay with writing that. I, I don't have an issue with those books. Uh, it's just for me personally, you know, that's where I come from, and so I like to reach out to the readers that are um, that are also interested in having that clean read. And all my books are like that. All right, great. Well, yeah. Well, thanks so much, Tara, for coming on the uh, on the podcast. Yeah. And, uh, it's been a lot of fun talking to you. Well, thank you so much for having me and giving me the opportunity to to reach out to your listeners and get a chance to, to share my stuff with other people. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of Meet the Thriller Author. I'd like to ask you to please review and rate this uh, podcast over on iTunes. It really helps me get the word out. If you take a few seconds of your time to uh, do that, it would be much appreciated. You can also visit my website at thrillingreads.com forward slash podcast for show notes on this episode, as well as information about the uh, podcast in general. And you can also sign up for my mailing list there. You'll be getting uh, special offers from our guests, as well as information, uh, behind the scenes information on the podcast. And uh, please do visit my author website at alanpeterson.com. I appreciate your support. And so until next episode, I will talk to you then.